Hello, folks. It's John Schneider, uh, the host of Jersey Bay Shark Country, a television program which many of you have seen and still continue to watch. I'm here in the old Truex burial ground in Kingsburg, New Jersey. Um, it is a great place to start our program. It's the holy ground, really. It's the place where some, not all, of course, of the settlers, our ancestors, who came here to Kingsburg to settle it, are buried. Some of them uh, were in the Civil War. Some of them experienced the Revolutionary War. There are uh, gravestones here that are from the 1700s, the 1800s, and even the 1900s. It's not a large cemetery, but it's the only cemetery in Kingsburg today. And I hope that you will um, come and visit it and pay your respects to the people who worked so hard to settle this land and create this town. It wasn't always called Kingsburg. Sometimes it was uh, Tanner's Landing or Granville. And uh, I, I walk around Kingsburg and you'll see vacant lots and little relics here and rusty things here. And you wonder, what was that? Well, we may never know. And uh, this program is an opportunity to kind of think about what life might have been like. We have a lot of old photographs, courtesy of a lot of people, including the uh, Kingsburg Historical Society, and my friend Les Horner and Randall Gabrielin. But you know, probably better than anybody, what the history is if you've been here for a while or your family has lived here for a while. And I urge you to contact the Historical Society of Kingsburg and share your knowledge. If you have photographs, share your photographs. You'll get them back, they'll scan them for you, and then they'll put them on display. On, uh, at their uh, building in, on Carr Avenue. This was a wonderful town, and it was uh, a town that experienced the ups and downs of a roller coaster ride. At its height, it was a place to come. It was a destination with rides like the Jackrabbit and the Merry-Go-Round and the F Ferris Wheel <laughs> and all kinds of things. And people used to come in the thousands uh, in the summertime to beat the heat from New York City and other places. They'd come on the steamships with big docks that went out into Raritan Bay. They'd get off those, uh, those steamships and walk into Kingsburg and they must have looked around and said, wow, this is fantastic. I mean, it, they could have gone to Coney Island, I suppose, but they didn't, they came here. And waiting for them here were, uh, I guess, the realtors of the day who said, why don't you stay here if you like it so much? You stay in our hotels, you can stay in a tent, you can stay in a cottage. Why don't you buy some land and stay here? And so many of them did. And a lot of the settlers who were wooed into coming to Keensburg were the people that uh, stepped off those, uh, those steamboats. Now, uh, we didn't have cars back then. I say we, but <laughs> our ancestors, many of the people who are interred here, had horses and they had to deal with things that we don't have to deal with very much. The summers were hot and sticky and there were mosquitoes. This was a swampy marsh area along the Raritan Bay. There were no white sandy beaches or lifeguards or bulldozers or any of that sort of thing. And there weren't cars. There were, like I say, horses and buggies and wagons. And people worked hard. And in the winter, it got cold and you darn well better have had a fireplace to keep warm. You had to go out and chop wood. And let's not forget there wasn't plumbing. You had to go to an outhouse behind your house. And uh, there probably wasn't sewage. There probably wasn't running water. And there were so many things that we take, uh, take for granted today that uh, our ancestors didn't have. And they had to struggle, they had to fight, they had to work hard, and they didn't live as long as us. And many of them are right here today. And you'll recognize many of the names if you come here and visit, like Seeley. Seeley is the name of a street here in, and Palmer. Palmer, there's so many names. Truax, Truax was the, the family that really started this burial ground. Now they did find a skeleton uh, that uh, is over there by the bluff. It, this overlooks uh, Waycake Creek. And uh, uh, the, the part of the cemetery keeps eroding. So unfortunately, some bodies and some headstones may have just washed into the creek. They discovered a skeleton here a while back, and um, he tried to pick it up to move it so they could bury it appropriately, and it disintegrated. It just fell apart, and from that, uh, that experience, they concluded that this must have been a Lenny Lenape, a Native American Indian burial ground. And some say that that is true, but it has never really been completely proven. 
So I hope you will enjoy uh, this uh, maybe series of episodes about the history of Kingsburg. And I hope that you'll get out and start looking around and see some of the old houses and some of the relics and imagine some of the things that existed back in the day. When you see an empty lot, wonder what was there? What house? What hotel? There are roads that have disappeared. Grandview Terrace, uh, I think it was Terrace, uh, is no longer here but uh, Grandview Apartments are. So what happened to the road? Where did it go? Some of the roads uh, went in different directions than they do today. And much of the town early in 1917, when this town was incorporated, uh, much of the town was a lot smaller. The roads didn't go out in every direction. The neighborhoods weren't as sprawling as they are today. And there were lots and lots and lots of farms. So you're gonna see all of that in this, uh, this program. And I hope you enjoy it. So let's get started. The story begins with Raritan Bay. Long before civilization rushed in to dominate its shores, it had been home to a number of Native American tribes. There is some archeological evidence suggesting we humans were already in the region at the close of the Pleistocene, about 10,000 years ago, and probably actively contributing to the mass extinction of a variety of North American wildlife species. The so-called early big game hunters vanished. But the coastal regions were resettled by peoples accustomed to village-style living in tidewater communities, which subsisted on hunting and gathering marine shellfish and eventually on agriculture. A vast number of shellfish fossils have been found around Raritan Bay and on Staten Island, a testament of the utilization of the bay for food by the Algonquin Indian tribes. These were the familiar Lenape Indians who occupied the area when early colonists arrived. And while Keensburg was formally established in 1917, the earliest inhabitants lived here long before any settlers would ever arrive. One of the first explorers to light the way for many others was Henry Hudson of England. And while some historians disagree a bit about exactly where Henry Hudson landed on the shores of the New Jersey side of Raritan Bay, everyone pretty much agrees it was September 3rd, 1609, when his ship, the Half Moon, set anchor. Now, they don't know where, but they think it was either present-day Kingsburg, or Atlantic Highlands, or the tip of Sandy Hook. One thing for sure, it was the beginning of the civilization of the New Jersey Bayshore and eventually the end of the Lenny Lenape Indians. But not before the crewmen of Henry Hudson's ship were attacked by the natives with one man, John Coleman, killed by an arrow which pierced his neck. He was to become, unfortunately, the first European to be murdered by a Native American arrow. Now, some historians believe he was buried in the area that is known today as the intersection Carr Avenue and Beachway in Kingsburg, known as Coleman's Point, named after John Coleman, who was killed by the arrow. And while Henry Hudson may have been one of the first explorers, Richard Hartshorn, who came from London, is generally credited with being the first settler. In 1669, he purchased a tract of land in Waycake, which is a word from the Lenny Lenape, which meant land of plenty. And later, during the mid-1800s, the name Waycake would be given to the lighthouse in Kingsburg. Another light, called a beacon light, now located in Leonardo, is pretty much a relic, was also built to provide so-called range lights for vessels passing through New York Harbor. So during this period of the 1670s, New Jersey is divided into two sections. West New Jersey was sold to the Quakers, and East New Jersey was owned by Sir George Carteret. And Monmouth County, by the way, is also established, but its boundaries didn't really become permanent until some 30 years later. Meanwhile, Richard Hartshorn purchased more than 2,000 acres, including most of Sandy Hook and Highlands, and is instrumental in removing the Lenny Lenape Indians from the area. Between then and the early 18th century, the rest of the land was eventually purchased over time from the Lenny Lenape, and it was soon inhabited by Dutch, English, and Scottish settlers. Incidentally, New Jersey is the only state that didn't acquire its land by force from local Native Americans. We, we bought and paid for it. And for the most part, the early settlers in our area did what they did best, multiply, expand, 
and civilize. <laughs> but then, by the 1770s, American settlers were getting pretty tired of the British government, telling them what they could do and what they couldn't do, and eventually taking advantage of them. During this time of great tension between those settlers wanting to stay loyal to the king and those who wanted freedom to build their own country, patriots of Monmouth County secretly contributed food and supplies to the people in Boston after the Boston Tea Party. And shortly thereafter, a so-called Monmouth Tea Party was held in Sandy Hook Bay in sympathy. By 1776, the Declaration of Independence had been written, and so the British fleet arrived off Sandy Hook to greet sympathizers with the British cause, mainly from Monmouth County. Eventually, the Sandy Hook Lighthouse was attacked by militiamen attempting to render it useless to the British, but believe it or not, they were unsuccessful. Then. In 1778, the celebrated Battle of Monmouth Courthouse between Sir Henry Clinton and General Washington seemed almost to be a defeat for the Americans. But instead, it was turned by the courage and promptness of General Washington into a victory. The night after the battle, and while the American army lay on their arms with the expectation of renewing the conflict in the morning, the British general stole away and gained the heights of Middletown and the protection of the guns of the British fleet, which were in Sandy Hook Bay. By 1783, the American Revolution was over. Four years later, New Jersey became the third state to ratify the new U.S. Constitution. Shortly after that, George Washington was elected as the first president of the United States in 1789. And New Jersey was the first state to sign the Bill of Rights. Meanwhile, Keensburg, remember Keensburg? Well, it wasn't called Keensburg, it was called Tanner's Landing from the early 18th century until the early 19th century. And Keensburg began to grow. Incidentally, Tanner's Landing came from a pier at the end of Tanner's Landing Road, which is now called Main Street. And at the time, Tanner's Landing was a major port for many, many years. The town then became known as Granville in 1854. The name came from Phillips Mill and a number of the grain producing farms in the area. During the 1880s, Granville had its own church, two lighthouses, a number of small businesses and lots of homes being built. Roads formed almost naturally as horse and buggies began to define the pathways to travel from one point to the next. And the beach, which still attracts tourists today, was a favorite destination back then for folks from surrounding areas. Granville had a population of about 300 residents, and they were mostly farmers, fishermen, and clamors, as you might expect. Before long, the Raritan and Delaware Bay Railroad connected New York via steamboat at Port Monmouth to Red Bank. But then, in 1861, the Civil War began, and Union soldiers were soon stationed on Sandy Hook. The following year, the present-day Twin Lights were constructed. Meanwhile, despite the war, Granville became an agricultural center as the Farmers' Transportation Company was formed to coordinate large quantities of produce shipped from our area. During the 18th century, Granville's fertile soil gave rise to a lot of farms where apples, pears, and corn were grown. By 1866, the first Methodist church was founded in Granville. Then five years later, in 1871, a school was built and would be replaced in 1912. Also in the same year, 1871, William A. Gilhouse was born in Matawan. Later, when he was 30 years old, he and some business partners would purchase a large amount of land in Granville. By 1877, a new 19-year-old pastor named William Ramsey came to the Granville Methodist Episcopal Church. Now, Ramsey was supposed to be the pastor for only one year, but he liked Granville so much he decided to live here permanently. So he purchased what became 69 Church Street and opened a general store in 1881. The following year, the Oyster Planters Association was established and it had more than 80 members. Eventually, Ramsey was instrumental in establishing the first post office in 1884. His wife actually became the first postmaster. And because John Kane, who was a candidate for Congress at the time, was instrumental in helping Ramsey with the post office, the town of Granville was changed to Canesburg in Kane's honor. 
and Canesburg became Keensburg over time. A few years later, a significant blizzard hit Keensburg, and two years after that, a school was constructed in the town for $30,000 at what today is the corner of Myrtle Avenue and Church Street, which is now Fallon Manor. By 1892, the railroad reached Keensburg, where the New York and Long Branch Line at Matawan was connected to Highlands. By the end of the 1800s, Keensburg began to grow very quickly, and other investors helped fuel further development of the town with their money. Postcards of the town were distributed to everybody to lure their investments toward purchasing land. Now, one major investor who believed in the area was William A. Gellhouse. We talked about him just a few minutes ago. He owned a bakery business in Atlantic Highlands, which he had started in 1893 with his brothers, and they owned it until 1905. Now, Gellhouse believed strongly in the future of Kingsburg and used his steamships to bring New Yorkers to Kingsburg and convince them to purchase homes. And of course, Gellhouse also entered the real estate business. Meanwhile, just after the turn of the century, the New Jersey Oyster Commission coordinated passage of a law in 1903 regulating oystering and clamming. In 1906, three years later, Camp John, a German social club and living area was built to promote health and well-being. And the camp was very large. It included a very big pavilion and tents for members. And two years later, the New Point Comfort Beach Company built a thousand foot pier, which was eventually extended to 2,000 feet to accommodate the steamships that were coming from New York. By 1909, the New Point Comfort Beach Company bought the steamboat Accomac in Norfolk, Virginia and started a scheduled run from New York to Keensburg to bring prospective property buyers to Keensburg. Another real estate developer created the Keensburg Heights Development Company and bought several thousand tickets for the steamship ride from New York City to Keensburg. And then people came by the thousands to visit Keensburg. Tourists from New York would take the ferry across Raritan Bay to Keensburg to spend a weekend or maybe even an entire summer vacation to escape the heat. One steamship called the City of Keensburg was specifically built for the Keensburg Steamship Company. By now, a great number of hotels were being built every year. For example, William A. Gellhouse built the New Point Comfort Hotel with a dance hall, and it was constructed right next to the hotel, but unfortunately the hotel was destroyed by fire in 1917, the same year that the town was incorporated. By 1910, the state of New Jersey passed a law calling for yearly inspections of oyster beds by the State Board of Health. The following year, Keensburg started holding its first summer carnival, which ran for eight days to promote the area as a great place for recreation and living. During 1912, New Jersey Governor Woodrow Wilson was elected president of the United States. In the same year, the New Point Comfort Volunteer Fire Company was organized and incorporated. Now, it had its first building on Oak Street, but it was later moved to a larger property at 192 Carr Avenue in 1959, where it's currently located. Now, with more and more people coming to Kingsburg and business booming, the Kingsburg Chamber of Commerce was established in 1913, and many of the businesses were financed by the recently established Kingsburg National Bank at the corner of Carr Avenue and Church Street, which later on became the new Borough Hall in 1997. And one of the first orders of business by the new Chamber of Commerce was to pass a resolution in favor of borough organization. And so in 1917, the borough became incorporated as the Borough of Kingsburg. And William Ramsey, remember him, he served as the first official mayor for two terms. And, and he today he's known as the father of Kingsburg. Soon, much of the land in Kingsburg was being actively developed. I mean, most of it was located in an area from Camp View Place to Highland Avenue, where sand was placed after being dredged from Raritan Bay. And one of the first streets to be completed was Carr Avenue. And of course, Kingsburg began to grow quickly and it became more populated. The, the Keensburg Beach Company sold off most of the surrounding land on Beachway Avenue. It wanted to focus only on the boardwalk and amusement area, which had now been created. 
And during this period in the town's life, a number of ordinances were passed, including one ordinance, which I thought was interesting, which prohibited indecent bathing apparel. Enforcing all the town's laws was the first police marshal of Keensburg, a man by the name of James Gilligan, and he stayed, he stayed until 1943. During this early period in the life of Keensburg, folks from Keensburg enlisted in America's armed forces during World War I. After the war was over, organized protests began to call attention to the pollution of Raritan Bay from plants, manufacturing plants, along the Raritan River and Staten Island. Even then, we knew pollution was not a good thing. But at the same time, Congress also ruled that alcohol was not a good thing and passed the National Prohibition Act in 1920 which wouldn't be repealed for some 13 years. Prohibition obviously encouraged the illicit trade of whiskey and Keensburg was not immune. Citizens living in Keensburg at this time were about 1,321 people and growing. And while they couldn't drink alcohol legally, they must have had a lot of fun riding the new miniature railroad, which was built on the long pier and operated until 1960. In the early 1920s, the Keensburg Public School, later called Francis Place School, was built. During 1925, New York City imposed a ban on all Raritan Bay clams until the ban was lifted in 1935, some 10 years later. The New Jersey State Board of Health also banned taking oysters and clams from Raritan and San Diego Bays for 10 years. Coincidentally, one of Kingsburg's first municipal sewage disposal plants was built during this same period of time on the north side of Forest Avenue near Main Street. And much of the town shore along the bay since its beginning was really marsh and kind of swampland like a lot of other shorelines surrounding Raritan Bay. And neighborhoods really didn't start developing until the early 20th century. By 1924, the property on which stood Beacon Beach Lighthouse became part of the new Keensburg. And oh, by the way, in 1927, did you feel it? An earthquake? It had its epicenter in Long Branch, but people in Keensburg could feel it. Then in 1929, the New York stock market crashed. And a year later, the population of Keensburg had reached 2,190 people. And most people lived to be about age 60. You could get a dozen eggs for 44 cents, and milk was 14 cents a quart. At the beginning of the 1930s, more than 15 million Americans, fully one quarter of all wage-earning workers, were unfortunately unemployed. President Herbert Hoover didn't do much to alleviate the crisis. Patience and self-reliance, he argued, were all Americans needed to get them through this passing incident in our national lives, he said. So getting away from the heat and strife people suffered in the area was important. And entertainment, especially cheap entertainment, was sought after. These were the days when big bands and swing music were very popular, like Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, and Glenn Miller. The 30s were difficult, but people still found ways to have fun. And one way was heading to the Jersey Shore. The Jersey Bay Shore was, was a major getaway, from Seabright to Highland Beach to Highlands and Atlantic Highlands to Keensburg, Keyport, and Cliffwood Beach. This is the Kingsburg Historical Museum. This is where history is being collected and stored and presented and preserved for your enjoyment. And you know, this is a building that was, uh, well, it was affected by Sandy back in 2012. That was the high water mark. And today everything is ready to go. There's still collections coming in and people are donating things. So if you have something, pictures, artifacts, anything you'd like to donate, come to 59 Carr Avenue and go in to the Historical Museum. Uh, let's take a look and see what they got. Well, first, first of all, they want you to sign in, which is important, and, and a lot of people have signed into this place. And then when you look up, you look around, you see some of the collection beginning to appear. Huge collection of photographs. Oh, there's a lighthouse. A lot of old stuff, and you know what? This is just the beginning of trying to restore this place. There's so much in storage right now, and volunteers are going through it, piece by piece, item by item, postcard by postcard, picture by picture, and they can certainly use your help. 
They love volunteers, and if you can volunteer to come down here and spend some time, either going through the artifacts or welcoming guests so that you can uh, be part of the history and restoring the history, please do. So here's a painting, an old painting. You know, baseball was a, was a great sport. And back in the old days, my friend Dougie, folks who since passed away, was integral to this historical history of Kingsburg. And I interviewed him, and he was just a wonderful guy. So much of this is dedicated to him. There's information about the Lenny Lenape Indians, and of course, there's a Kingsburg flag. And so along the wall are all the pictures, not all of them, Boy, did I say all of them? No, just part of the collection. And if you're an aficionado of Keensburg history, you know it wasn't always called Keensburg. For a while, it was called a number of things, including Tanner's Landing, but here it is, Granville. And here's where everybody lived, see? And look at, look at this, right in the window, it looks like an old game board of some kind, and yet all of the businesses back in those days have taken a spot on this game board and many of the businesses are no longer here, some are, and new businesses are coming in Keensburg every day. In the last year, 15 new businesses came. And before Keensburg Amusement Park, uh, which was owned off and on by the Gale House family, there was the boardwalk. And remember, every Tuesday, five cents a day on all kiddie rides, that's right. This was, I, I'm gonna almost say, this was the steamboat capital of Raritan Bay. Uh, there were steamboats and, and the Gellhouse family actually owned or built a steamship, I don't know which one, but this is the city of Keensburg and uh, it was a steamship that used to leave the uh, New York uh, City area and bring passengers here and people would come here because it was so darn hot in New York and people would uh, come over here and they loved it so much many of them decided to settle here. This is a place, you know, you're not gonna spend a day here, not yet, but you might at some point. At least come by, pay your respects, talk to folks. They have stuff that, that isn't even out that they'll show you. Uh, maps and old newspaper articles and, and you name it. Just come by. You, you gotta come by, 59 Carr Avenue. Call them, 732-471-0408 or visit them at kingsburg-historical.org.